All right. It is four o'clock and I know we have a lot of information to cover. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and uh, get this uh, get this webinar started. So we, I know we've got people that are still kind of coming in. So over the next uh, next few seconds, a minute or so, we're going to get this uh, get this conversation going. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, tuning in um, and uh, coming to, to, to check out the intersection of NFTs and sports. Um, excited to have Courtney Altimus uh, from Team Altimus with us, as well as Jonah Ballo uh, from Heartland, and just uh, really excited um, for, uh, for this conversation today. We've got so much stuff to talk about, so I think we should probably uh, get going. So um, first and foremost, just want to give you a sense of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we've got a, kind of a jam-packed lineup of, of, you know, various items to talk about. So one of the things that we want to be able to talk about, just what are NFTs, right? I mean, I know that in for those of you who are joining us who are part of an athletic department at a college or, or university, um, you've likely heard about NFTs from student athletes um, or potentially from other conversations that you've had. Uh, but we definitely want to get into what exactly is it that we're talking about with NFTs. We're going to spend some time talking about name, image, and likeness and how NFTs are going to play a role or potentially could play a role when it comes to name, image, and likeness so that you and your athletic departments are prepared for the impact that that can have. Um, and then we're going to get into just, just further the intersection of, of sports and NFTs and the impact on um, the financial impact, the legal impact, cryptocurrency. There's so much to talk about, so little time. Uh, so we want to get right into it. And I'm happy to turn it over uh, to my good friend, uh, Courtney Altimus. Courtney, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Luke. And welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon to talk about this incredible intersection and, and the hype around NFTs, which is growing by the day. And we're so excited to have Jonah with us, Jonah Bello. He is with the Heartland Group. And I basically would describe Jonah as the intersection of sports <laughs> and NFTs. Um, and I say that because he spent several years in the NBA as, as on-air talent in Minnesota and New York. And he also led their digital, uh, digital content strategy and maybe even all the other content strategy he basically did it all, and he is an incredibly experienced storyteller. So he brings all those components of what a successful NFT is. And I am thrilled to turn it over to him to talk to us about it and give us a sense of what he's been working on and what they are. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you so much, Courtney. I appreciate that. I, I hope I can live up to those uh, kind words. Um, no, I did spend 10 years in the NBA started with the Minnesota Timberwolves, then made my trek eastward to the New York Knicks, um, where I was doing a lot of on-camera work and also running the digital strategy, as Courtney has mentioned, and then spent some time in New York City at a marketing agency running the digital content team there. So I've seen a lot of different versions of how content can play out uh, strategically from a creative standpoint and can live with Fortune 500 companies and also can take place with brands, teams, and leagues. And this is what's so great about this conversation is yes, while we're talking about NFTs, we're also talking about fun content that can live in social media and can also live on the NFT platforms and can be a source of revenue, right? For teams, conferences, leagues, and finding out the best way to do that. So at Heartland Group, uh, we have started a company in which is based in content, uh, strategic sort of creative strategy, and working with brands, leagues, and teams. So uh, I'm so happy that Heartland can take part in this. Um, we have some fun stuff to show uh, everybody today with a recent hot off the presses NFT project with a former WNBA athlete who is famous in her own right. And so uh, we'll get into a lot of fun uh, content to share here shortly. Awesome, Jonah, we are so pumped that you're here. Um, so listen, for all of, uh, all of our, our attendees, please do, if you have questions, don't wait until the end, throw them in the Q&A portion now um, as they come up so that way we can address them. We're gonna have two different kind of periods of time where we're gonna stop and take those uh, questions and answers. We're not gonna hold off until the end. Um, and so we're gonna have kind of about the midway point, we're gonna have a chance where we take some Q&A and then we'll do that again uh, towards the end. So if you have questions, 
go ahead, click that Q&A button, throw them in there, and that way we can see them and we can make sure that we're answering your questions. So with that being said, let's let's just get into it. Let's start talking about NFTs, right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you um, kind of a, a technical perspective of, of NFTs um, in, in the way and the, from the perspective that we um, acknowledge them. Um, and then very clearly, you're going to hear from Jonah, who actually deals with them every day, and you're going to have a much better understanding uh, of what they are. But I wanted to just you know, start off by kind of setting the stage of, of what we're talking about today. So when you think about NFTs, you know, at, whenever you have something that's, um, you know, when, when you, you know, when you have the initials of something, you think, okay, if I know what the initials stand for, then I can kind of figure out what it is. Unfortunately, NFTs aren't necessarily like that, right? So it's, it's this idea that NFTs are non-fungible tokens, right? And so that's what it stands for. But I think it's important to understand what, what does that actually mean, right? So Fungible. Fungible is, is the ability for any type of asset to be able to ex be exchanged uh, with another asset of the same type, right? So if you think about it, if, uh, if I gave Courtney a dollar bill, she could give me back another dollar bill, or she could give me four quarters, 10 dimes, what have you, right? There's this fungible nature of it. Um, cars, houses, those kind of things are non-fungible, right? They have value, but they're, they're non-fungible. So when we think about an NFT, it really is like a one-of-a-kind representation of something digital or something physical, right? So it's a token. It can't be exchanged with another token, right? And that's different than things like cryptocurrency in the sense that like Bitcoin, right, is exchangeable for another Bitcoin, right? So, you know, NFTs have really kind of popped up in the creative world, um, art, um, you know, digital imagery, um, but also in sports, right? And it's become very popular in sports. I think, you know, we'll talk more about some of the different examples, but NBA's Top Shot, um, their website, it's a collaboration with um, Dapper Labs where they have NFTs, um, where the league itself has partnered with the, uh, the players union, and they've come together to have these um, digital collectibles, right? And so these, these NFTs, and you'll see some examples that Joan is going to share here in a little bit, they can be anything, right? It can be a, a tweet, an image of a tweet. It could be some other digital image. It could be video. It could be music with it. It could be art, right? And the value proposition here is that they're digitally unique, that they're one of a kind. So if you think about it, um, Jack Dorsey, right, the CEO of Twitter, he had uh, he made an NFT out of his very first tweet. And when you think about it, any one of us could go in and we could scroll Twitter, scroll his Twitter feed and scroll all the way back, try to find his first tweet, right? And we could get an image of it. And so you're thinking to yourself, well, why would I pay the person that, that purchased that NFT paid hundreds of thousands of dollars? Why would I pay hundreds of thousands of dollars when I could just take a screenshot and have an image of it? Well, Joan is going to talk more about kind of the uniqueness of, of, of NFTs, but in essence, it's because it is a one of a kind. It is backed where it has its own, um, you know, kind of serial number, if you will, right? So that that way, you know, that you're owning one or a certain number of um, released NFTs. And it's that value, that uniqueness um, that creates, um, that, that's created this digitally authenticated, you know, kind of token that makes it unique and make it, makes it have val value over time. So I've said a lot. Um, it's probably important to have someone now make a little bit more sense of all that. So, Jonah, I'm going to turn it over to you to make this a little bit more real, showing some examples and, and explaining what we're talking about here. That was a great job, Luke. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think that the, it's really not that complicated as we start to work through this and see some of the examples. But instead of using my own voice, I think we're going to throw it to Renee Montgomery here, who I mentioned earlier, who can give a primer on NFTs and what this is all about. And this is a piece of content we made with her to really uh, launch her collection so her fan base could understand what exactly NFTs are. So let's hear from Renee Montgomery herself. I don't think we can hear the audio on that. Maybe if we wanna rewind and try that one more time. replace with something else for example a bitcoin is fungible trade one bitcoin for another bitcoin and you'll have exactly the same thing a one-of-a-kind digital trading card however is non-fungible if you trade it for a different card you'd have something completely different so basically a virtual trading card and you have an asset in crypto 
Buying an NFT gets you bragging rights as well. There will be a limited amount released and we will never re-release the starting five. Also, by buying one of my NFTs, you'll be supporting my nonprofit as a portion of the proceeds will be donated to the Renee Montgomery Foundation. Thank y'all for listening. Go check out my starting Bob. Let's go. Gotta love that energy, right? Renee Montgomery brings it. Well, this was an interesting case study that I can walk y'all through and, and talk about Heartland Group and what we did. Um, as I've mentioned before, we are a creative agency. We create content that is at the core of what we do. Um, we started with Renee when she uh, was in um, the WNBA still, and she opted out of the season because of COVID. Uh, she decided to start a podcast and a show. It's an hour show that lives on video, lives on audio. And uh, she looked to us to do the creative and the production behind her show. Um, she decided to retire on that show. She has made announcements. And part of what we do at Heartland is also work directly with athletes to help give them the content to succeed um, in their next stages or even during their career um, it, whatever profession that they're doing. So she then came to us and said, guys, I want to jump on the NFT wagon and I want to get involved. Um, Renee very much sees herself. Um, we talked about the intersection right in the beginning and Courtney mentioned that too. Well, there's sports and there's business and there's tech. And I believe all three of these are converging in a major way now. It's, it's honestly a very exciting time because I think the athletes are at the forefront of, of this movement. And Renee wanted to start this NFT collection called the Starting Five, as she mentioned in uh, that primer video. So Heartland Group decided to concept out what that would look like. And uh, Luke also mentioned that there's, you know, it could just be a tweet. It could just be um, a moment that uh, happened on a website or, or very small sort of low lift examples from a creative standpoint. But we wanted to take it to that next level because in our at estimation, we want something that has value, not just only from the scarcity of it, and that is a big part of this, but also with a visual element to it. I think an easy way to think about these is as is, is a piece of art, right? And if there's only one of 11 or there's only one of one, the scarcity allows that proposition, the value proposition to go much higher in how much people will pay. But it's also tied to a famous athlete in a specific moment in time. So Rashad, we can roll some of the examples while I talk about um, what we did with Renee was we basically decided we're going to create a whole world, the Renee Montgomery NFT court. And as you can see, it kind of has a space vibe to it, a futuristic look. And you'll see a lot of those from okay, the NFT I'm space. So and it's really interesting Renee, because starting five of my NFT. Oh, <laughs> there she is again. She just keeps popping in. Um, but what's great about this concept that it has a very unique look and feel. Elliot Gerard is our creative director and, and him and I concepted this idea of having this glass box that would have a 3D feel of it. And this is her opt out tweet, but behind it has some art behind it, right? It gives some context to why she opted out and what's going on in, in her life. These are six rings, right? That she won during her story career. One of six that you can get as an NFT. So again, you're starting to see the creative elements of this, but it's also storytelling. And that at our core, that is what we are. We're storytellers. This is a moment where she scored seven threes, a record in the WNBA. So there's all these cool moments that we wanted to highlight. And then she was uploading them to a site called OpenSea, which is a platform that allows you to sell and auction off the NFTs. Now, also another component to this that I love as part of Heartland Group, it's not only a revenue generator, like it, it Anybody out there in, in, this, in this discussion here was, came to us and said, Heartland, we would like to do the same thing. We can look at a, a couple streams. It's a, a PR vehicle, it's social media content, because these can still live on social media, but they're, they're validated, right? They're, they're only one of 11 that are gonna be actually purchased on the NFT platform. And then there's another component that we love, which is uh, her foundation, right? That you can give back to the community. It's another way to have um, some money that can go into causes for athletes, conferences, leagues. And I think that's a really nice piece of this. But again, I would say, you know, these are collectibles and you can look at them as like, you know, I remember my grandfather, he collected stamps. I don't know how much those are worth these days, but he was into those. And, and some people say, I don't understand collecting stamps. Well, the same could be said about NFTs, but what is the, the same about them is it's scarcity. Only one person is gonna own that piece. And we love the idea of telling the story for athletes and being able to connect it. And Renee has really enjoyed this starting five. It got her in Forbes um, and many other athlete or other outlets that covered this. 
So it was a big PR hit for her as well. And I think we'll start to see, and we're starting to see athletes release their own collections and be able to do that. Also some leagues and teams, um, the Golden State Warriors is a great example. They had uh, a ticket or a, their championship rings that were going to be NFTs. You can imagine if a, uh, a fan was walking into your arena and they have a ticket, but then they find out that's actually a code on the back to get their own NFT. So there's very cool activations with that. And that's what Heartland's really trying to uncrack the code and work with our partners and work with potential clients on how can we make this unique and valuable, not just by the asset, but the other things that you can do with it from a marketing standpoint as well. So hopefully that pro provides a case study to what we've done and some examples that kind of shine a light on NFTs and how a professional athlete was able to achieve success uh, through this creation. No, thanks for that, Jonah. Um, great, great feedback. And I think, you know, what's, what's important here, and you just finished it with it, um, you said, you know, you talked about professional athletes, right? And one of the questions that we have in the Q&A, and, and feel free, again, as you have questions to, to put them in the Q&A, and we'll, we'll get to them um, throughout, is, you know, the question is, are NFTs only for professional athletes, or are NFTs allowed through name, image, and likeness with college uh, athletes? And so, you know, again, um, as of right now, we have numerous examples on the professional side um, of athletes getting involved with NFTs. Um, and when name, image, and likeness, obviously it's not, um, there, there's NF, uh, name, image, and likeness, NIL is not yet um, approved. Um, but once it is, then um, student athletes are going to likely want to get involved with NFTs. Um, I think we all know, especially those who work with student athletes on a regular basis, how they're always intrigued and interested by um, whatever is new and what's the latest kind of thing um, that they can be involved in and whether it's something that they're interested in or just because they have teammates who are doing it now they want to do it um, we'll definitely be seeing student athletes when the time comes um, either be approached to start having their own nfts or to be involved and engage themselves um, but courtney I, I think it's important to kind of start to to think as we thought through and, and heard from jonah about kind of just the the process um, uh, of NFTs and, and how they're kind of developed, the creative process, the storytelling, maybe to spend a little time talking about this intersection of, of NFTs and sports and kind of where you see that um, playing a role. We've talked a lot about the pro level, obviously it's gonna occur at the college level, but just generally, what are, what are your thoughts there? Well, I think um, one of the things that struck me the most in, in researching this is that creative aspect. I, I didn't understand that, you know, if somebody, and if you think about uh, collegiate student athletes when NIL starts, you know, if they have a lot of social media followers, they may think I can launch, I can, you know, put an NFT up, I can create one, I can sell one, it's going to be great, all my followers will want it. Well, one of the things that is so striking is that the, the, the market for the NFT is not there's a very low overlap with the social media followers so that doesn't equal one for one just because somebody has a lot of followers doesn't mean their nft is going to be successful so you know one of the things i think about is as student athletes are getting excited about it and they're watching you know the the recent draft picks trevor lawrence um you know started his with a collection of six and he, you know, Jonah, he, he gave money to charity through that. Devonta Smith, he's done a really cool thing. He's not only uh, launching NFTs, but he's created his own cryptocurrency, Smitty Coin. And you can use Smitty Coin to purchase uh, a uh, Super Bowl watch party. You can use Smitty Coin to um, possibly get a personal conversation with um, Devonta. Like he's, he's using it sort of that warriors example that you gave jonah to to do to come up with creative ways to engage and obviously make money he also is sending a portion of his proceeds back to his church in his hometown so i think that when i look at the intersection it's exciting on one hand because it is a different group of collectors it allows these athletes to express their creative side um it's a different market and it's new so they can actually you know take that brand that they've created about themselves and enhance it through their craft and their sport 
they can also show their creative side and other talents that they have. My concern is because it's new, because it's exciting, and because we see all the big numbers up there, that student athletes may think it's just a great thing to do and it's just really easy. I'm sure they could find a developer in a heartbeat who wants to create an NFT, but they need to understand different platforms are quicker than others. There are different fees. They have to understand that whole market and follower base and the difference between it. So um, I think just like you know the stamp collection or, or baseball cards, now they have playing cards for every sport. I'm showing how old I am because I referenced baseball cards first, but there are collectors. People get excited about things. So I, I think it's exciting, but I think everybody needs to tread very, very carefully. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, um, you know, when you talked about the baseball cards, we'll just say, you know, with baseball cards, it's interesting, right? Because if I, if I were to buy baseball cards, I could go, um, you know, maybe I get pull a, 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 I don't know, a Mike Trout card or something, whatever. Right. And I, I get this card and I'm like, wow, what's its value? Now I have to go somewhere, right? I have to engage someone. I have to go talk to someone. I got to go into a, a store show somebody the card that I've put in plastic and maybe I put it in harder plastic now because there's value there and they're evaluating what, you know, what type of condition it's in all to get me to a point of possibly knowing what the market value, you know, might be. And with NFTs, you know, it's interesting because you can, you can find that information out a lot faster, right? Because the market is what the market will afford and what the market will pay for it, um, which is, which is interesting. You know, Jonah, when you kind of think about just this intersection, right, obviously you are at the intersection. I think Courtney said you were the intersection um, of NFTs and sports. You know, kind of <laughs> I'm going to change my bio to that. I'm going to change that. Well. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You can it's create official. your own NFT that, that says that that's what you are. It um, is official. That's right. That's right. <laughs> what do you see? What do you see kind of happening? Um, you know, and, and just to touch on one of the questions, you know, in the, in the Q&A that came up is how do you see, like, does this trend have staying power, right? I mean, what do you see happening? And then what, what do you think, what do you foresee if you looked into that, you know, crystal NFT ball, right, to the future, what do you kind of see happening? Is this something that's going to last? Well, it doesn't, we don't have to necessarily look at NFTs being specifically something that has lasting power or crypto that necessarily, has. It's, it's sort of the trend towards blockchain and this digital collectible space and also ownable assets for athletes, conferences and teams, right? That there's another avenue towards revenue that is a possibility, right? And, and again, it doesn't have to be a straight line how much money they can make off of it. There is sort of these activations physically that you can do with uh, the NFTs and explore ways in which fans can get involved because Let's be honest, the evolution of sport is changing in the way that fans consume sport, right? It's not the same as it was. Actually, fans are less likely to go into stadiums to watch games. And that is something that is going to be uh, a challenge, right? As we get better and bigger TVs and better internet and, and, a, and a home experience that challenges what you can do inside the arena. So there is some cool live activation components to an NFT that can draw fans together. And it could also be an, an ownable asset. So I, I would say, I at least personally, um, I take my eyes less off of specifically the NFT, but more the movement towards uh, a digital technology that will be interesting. And especially when we look at athletes and for them to own something, right? Um, so many times they, they are fractioned off of what they bring to the table in terms of their skill sets and a team owns it, then the league owns it and the television networks own them. And then they give some to the manager and some of the agent, all the all these different things pulling apart sort of their ability to own a piece of content or even be involved in the creative space. What we have noticed, and Renee is the perfect example, is athletes coming to us and saying, I want to collaborate. I want to be part of the creative process. I got ideas here and I want to share in that. And that gets me excited because that is something that I think is changing and something that we're going to see. LeBron James is the biggest one, and, and I don't always want to point to him as the example, but he is starting the trend of ownable assets, ownable television networks, ownable content that he can play a role in. And it's not only about the money and what he can achieve from an ego standpoint, but it is about the, the pattern that can follow through with other people being able to get their message and their narrative across. So it's a long-winded way of saying 
um, that I think there's a, there's a bigger movement actually taking place here, aside from specifically the NFT aspect of it. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think um, uh, the first baseball card, they say, traces back to 1886. So, and baseball cards are still around 140 whatever years later. And so, you know, when we think about NFTs, if you look at it from a digital collectible perspective, um, you know, the ability to own an aspect of uh, the game or your favorite player as a fan, then I think we're going to see this last. Now, are we going to see values, you know, and move the same way that we've seen them move here over the last six months? Maybe not. Maybe things start to, um, you know, kind of settle out over time. But I, but I think the, to the idea of, is this just a fad that's not going to be around later? I think that it's definitely uh, going to continue to be around because that's how we're operating more and more to Jonah's point. The other piece, I think- uh, Nick, I, I want to quickly jump in real quick too, because yeah. I think you touched on something really important is the fan component. And we always have to be aware of that in this industry because the fans are the ones paying the money to fund all the, all the television networks and stadium. There is something real and exciting about opening a pack. I think that's like universal across human nature is that real time excitement, whether it's Willy Wonka <laughs> or whether it's winning the lottery ticket, going to scratching them off and turning it in or going to Vegas. There is something to that. And NBA Top Shot tapped into that real time open pack, but it's digital. As you said, Luke, like you don't have to go to a store. You don't have to travel. You have to get the, the, the uh, asset, the, the, the card graded. But that moment online where you can open it up and you can maybe trade it with friends, it's just an evolution of our, our human nature to want the excitement of the potential. Of what's the common that excitement? So I'm sorry to cut you off. I just wanted to add that into it yeah absolutely i mean it does there is so much from the fan perspective which actually does play a role in somewhat of the legal discussion that we'll kind of get into later right um but to your point about opening up up the uh the packs on nba top shot um i did it uh you know i got involved just because i wanted to start to understand it right that's the easy way to understand is to say okay i'm gonna buy some packs and start to get into this and um now my son will constantly who's 11 will constantly ask me like did you get any new packs and if I do, I can't open them until he's there with me so we can experience this together, which I will tell you is a lot of fun. Um, it really is an experience to, to, to do that. Um, one thing that I'll say that I see a lot as well um, when we think about this intersection is the, the, how broad the spectrum is when it comes to NFTs and sports. Obviously, we've seen at the pro level, you know, baseball started off, they had a platform and then they've kind of you know, stop that platform and they're reevaluating other platforms. The NFL is obviously in conversations to, to evaluate. The NBA has kind of led the way. Um, but we've also seen it at the high school level. I mean, in the sense that high school parents, um, high school elite athletes have been asking and been talking about wanting to know and understand NFTs. And I think that goes back to this combination of both the, um, the fan interest element, but also the way for people to control content and control their kind of content and what they wanted to deliver um, to the audience and to, the, to their fan base as well. So it's, it is most definitely going to be interesting to see how we kind of cross those, you know, all those spectrums here um, in the near future. So what we can do, we've got a couple questions in the chat. Um, again, if you have questions, feel free to throw them in Q&A um, and we will, uh, we will work to address them. Um, one of the questions um, is that, uh, and Joan, I'll throw this over to you. Um, does Renee profit, and you don't have to answer it specific to Renee, you can talk about it generally, but how does the, how does the talent, um, who's the, 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 the subject of an NFT, how does the talent kind of profit when someone else purchases um, an NFT? And then on top of that, just to add to their question, I know, you know, how does that work also, if you can explain a little bit more how that works when it's then when that buyer then goes on and sells it to someone else and, and beyond, how does that work? Yeah, so it's pretty basic, right? I mean, Renee came to us to do the, the creative part of it. So we produce it just as if you were hired to do any type of work uh, creative wise. And then you get it to a platform. I mentioned OpenSea a lot. That's probably the most mainstream one, I think, at this point. Um, and the athlete receives the sale price of it. So it's an Ethereum. Uh, which, is a, which is a coin that you can trade and can utilize for purchase, and that converts to dollars. Um, so the athlete gets directly back to the athlete for that sale. Now, the 
purchaser owns that piece of collectible and then can go resell. So, um, you know, there, I talked to my fiance the other night about Chanel bags, right? You can resell Chanel bags for a profit. Um, uh, hopefully you got a real one. So make sure it's, it's valid. And that's the other interesting point. You definitely know with, with the NFTs because of blockchain that you're getting a real minted piece of property and an ownable asset. So it's, it's basically that simple. And so the athlete does have to make a decision, right? Um, and, and, if it, and that athlete can work with an agency like ours or, or um, somebody who's in that space of price setting. Where are we gonna start this price? And if it goes for X amount of dollars, are they comfortable with that being sold and then potentially being resold, right? That, that um, there isn't necessarily a revenue share off of each transaction that usually go back into the platform. So it's a pretty simple process for it. Um, and it's, it's interesting too, I think from this component of the value of it, if you were able to look through the blockchain ledger and sort of see, oh my God, LeBron James is the first player to own this. Maybe he bought it from somebody else and you're buying something directly for him the value then can increase. Um, and so some people are actually buying NFTs as I'm stashing this away and I think it's going to be something that I can resell for later where it could be something like, hey, my friends are over, I'm going to brag to them, I got this NFT piece, let's check it out. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of aspects, but to directly hit the question, that's sort of how it works in terms of athlete receiving a profit or revenue from the sale. Awesome, awesome, thanks. Courtney, I want to come to you in this, with this next question. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Courtney spent the bulk of her career on Wall Street. Um, and so when you think about this in terms of, you know, investing or purchasing NFTs, right? I mean, is the difficulty level, like, what is that difficulty level as compared to, say, investing in the stock market? And what are some of those similarities and, and maybe differences in terms of how you should look at the, the financial investments that you might make, that one might make into NFTs? I would compare, so there's two levels to it. There's NFTs and there's cryptocurrency because you're purchasing NFTs with cryptocurrency and to get it back into cash, you have to convert it back to the dollar. So, so the NFT market to me is most similar to the art market. Um, so, you know, talking about buying and, and putting them away for really for investing, that's how you have to think of it as an investor. So you have to really understand, you have to spend some time. If, if you want to invest in an NFT to make a profit over time, you can't just jump on and buy one and think it's going to be, you know, a, the equivalent of a Cezanne in 10 years. You have to understand who the creator is, who, who is the storyteller, who is the subject, whether it's an athlete or not, and be comfortable with your investment. Um, obviously, if you're just buying for the collection piece, that's a different story. But as an investor, there's another level to this, which uh, we all know I can talk for hours about this. So I will try to keep it um, kind of brief. But think of cryptocurrency as, as a foreign currency. And you're doing an exchange every time you want to convert that crypto into cash. So it's not as, as um, risky as it used to be. It's a, it's a highly traded market now. To, to give you some sense of how quickly this is moving. So gold became an asset class 45 years ago. And cryptocurrency is outpacing gold when it first started to become a legitimate asset class more than double. So, so the growth is just astronomical. Cryptocurrency at the end of 2017, the average daily trading volume was 14 billion. Starting 2021, it was 81 billion. And to give some more context to that, the Russell 2000 only trades 53 billion a day. And a smid cap portfolio, an average one, will trade 81 billion a day. So the point is the crypto market is becoming more liquid um it's extremely volatile so not nearly as you know if you look at an s p 500 portfolio that's going to be much 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 lower risk than this but in terms of the ability to get in and get out it's gotten a lot better over the last three years but the education component is key and as an investor you really have to approach 
approach the asset class as if it were um, a venture capital investment, almost an angel investment. And I say that because that volatility is so huge. So you don't know what that underlying value is going to do minute to minute, day to day. So easy from the perspective of, yes, it's just like buying a stock. You're, you're you know, exchanging the currency and there's a market that's trading very liquid all day, but easy to understand and predictable, not nearly as straightforward as the public stock market. Awesome. Thank you for, for sharing that, Courtney. So um, one, one question, we'll take another question here, and then we're going to move on to some of the financial legal um, areas and, and really then the intersection um, with name, image, and likeness and some of the um, opportunities potentially and you know challenges um, with athletic departments and, and NFTs. So there was a question about, you know at this point, is there a centralized platform to purchase NFTs? The, the quick answer to that, you heard Jonah mention OpenSea um, earlier. That's kind of one of the main ones. Nifty Gateway is another one. There's no singular... Um, centralized platform for all NFTs. A lot of times it depends on um, whose NFTs they are, right? So the NBA, um, you can only get NBA um, top shot through the NBA top shot, um, top shot uh, platform. And so that's, you know, hopefully that gives some, some context there. So I want to get in briefly, you know, talking about some of the, some of the legal financial um, uh, challenges, um, or at least considerations that come when you think about um, engaging in NFTs. And from a legal perspective, there are some, some different challenges, right? Securities laws, um, copyright, and just, just overall understanding what, what it is that you are agreeing to be a part of. Securities laws really comes up more so for the, the, the people who are the company, the entity, the organization that is actually creating the NFTs. Um, there's a lot of discussion right now um, at the Department of Treasury level around NFTs and um, whether or not NFTs should be considered securities. Um, the Supreme Court has kind of dealt with this in the past in terms of what actually um, uh, is a security, right? And so there's a, there's a test to be used around like uh, investment contracts and understanding that. And so it will, a lot of it will depend on the purpose of the NFT, right? So um, how is it being marketed to buyers? And so when you think about, you know, if it re relates to an existing asset, um, you know, like a moment in time of sports marketed as a collectible, right? Especially if it's fan focused and that kind of thing, it's less likely to be considered a security. But if it's, you know, created solely to, you know, potentially earn an investment and a return, you know, then it could very easily, you know, slide to that security um, aspect. When you think about copyright law, there's, there's kind of two ways of thinking about this, right? Because NFTs create this, they're one of a kind. So they have this digital certificate of ownership that you get, right, for lack of a better term. And that's what makes them unique. Their, um, their kind of individual um, recognition of this NFT, one of one, one of 11, or whatever that might be. Um, and NFTs will intersect with copyright law uh, because under U.S. law, right, copyrights um, provide that certificate of ownership for a work of art or for um, other uh, performances or what have you. And that includes the right to control who then can make copies of the work, right? So it, it talks about who can sell it, who can license it, who can transfer that copyright, who can make derivatives from it. So understanding that aspect is important from a couple different perspectives, right? When you buy, we've been talking about NBA Top Shot, for example. If you buy like one of these NBA NFTs, it's a video and you'll see a video of an NBA player passing, dunking, you know, making an assist, um, you know, or, or, or what have you, hitting a three-pointer. And so that comes from the video that was taken during that game. So when somebody buys the NFT, they don't then automatically own the right to that you know that six seconds or four seconds of of imagery right that video what they own is just this nft and that because of that um it's important to understand that that the, the the owner of that nft can't then take that nft that video and then go make their own derivative works um off of that video because that video ultimately is licensed from the nba right and their media partners and so when we think more broadly about this and i know we'll talk about it in a little bit um but that's where we've had a lot of questions from conferences and um from schools themselves 
where you have media partners and you own, um, end up owning media assets, that's one of those things then that you'd want to think about if a conference or if a school were to consider potentially engaging in their own line of NFTs related to um, their student athletes and their athletic ability, et cetera. So when we think about that, you know, um, the other piece to think about it from the other angle, from a copyright intellectual property perspective, really is understanding what's being shown, right? What copyrights, what trademarks are being used in that NFT? And does the person who is creating them have the right to actually use those or to have those marks, those um, you know, copy, copyrighted lyrics, whatever it might be, to have them used in an NFT? So when you think about student athletes engaging or being involved, you know, obviously from a name, image, and likeness perspective, you know, we know it, it's pretty common um, understanding that student athletes will not be able to use um, their school or their institution's marks. So you wouldn't imagine seeing a current current student athlete um, having a, a, an NFT where they're wearing their school's uniform or, you know, in the school's um, arena with other protected marks throughout the arena uh, because they wouldn't have the rights to that. So again, just some different things to think about from that perspective um, in terms of how kind of this legal space is going to play into NFTs. There's the, the developer side, right, that, that are these bigger legal issues, but student athletes are going to have to understand these some of these legal issues as well. And obviously, finance is going to be a big part of it, understanding the financial components, you know, the impact of crypto, as Courtney mentioned earlier. So for that, Courtney, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Luke. So, yeah, I talked about the financial aspect on sort of a macro level before, but specifically to student athletes and NIL space, I'd like to sort of dial it back to very, very basic. Um, if a student athlete is interested in creating an NFT and selling it, you know, I think we need to compare it to any other opportunity they might have. So if they have... Um, an opportunity to post a video of themselves, um, post themselves wearing something for a company who wants them to market their gear. There's a contract. They post what they're supposed to post, they get paid. Now, it's not that it takes five minutes to do, but it's very straightforward. And they will have heard from Luke what they're supposed to look for in contracts. So they'll know exactly what they're signing up for. They'll know what they need to do, what they're obligated to do. And then they'll send their invoice and get paid. If they want to engage a developer, an artist to create an NFT, it's a much longer process. I mean, first and foremost, they need to do their due diligence on the people they're going to be working with. The developer, the artist, they need to do pricing research, um, reputational research, and then actually engage in the creation. They need to understand how they ultimately get paid. You know, in the Renee Montgomery example, it's you know after the trade, are they going to use some of the proceeds to help a platform that they want to support? Are they going to just use all the proceeds for themselves? Um, the process is much, much, much more involved and it's very risky and not as straightforward as some of the other examples I gave. So I think that in approaching it, student athletes, um, will need to understand more about the process. You know, I talked about education before, get education, educated on what it is, how it works, how long that process takes, how involved they need to be. And at the end of the day, do they have time to engage in this versus any other potential NIL activity? Um, not saying they don't. And I know so many of these athletes have so many talents. I'm sure many of them have already done their research and they're ready. Um, but I think from a financial perspective and a time perspective, student athletes need to be very cautious. And then, you know, getting back to the investment piece of it, it's not, it's not just as easy as posting a collection of five and getting a lot of money. You may not, they may not sell, they may sell for $10. So if you're counting on it to be an immediate 
income earner, that's not a safe way to approach it. And then secondly, that whole exchange factor and the risk of the valuations of cryptocurrency. It is, we've all seen it over the last couple of months. I mean, Elon Musk can go on Saturday Night Live and move market like nobody. And when you see markets reacting like that to those types of events, you cannot count on any level, any level. I don't care where you invest. So approaching it, you know, if you do sell an NFT as a student athlete and you make some money, you should know you've got to get out of the crypto right away and turn it into cash because you've done it. You don't want to ride that volatility after you've actually been successful in creating that NFT. Um, and I would just say, you know, I think we're going to see so much more interest. Uh, there was a survey done recently by the Journal of Financial Planners and uh, financial advisors said that in 2020, uh, about 17% of the financial advisors said their clients had kind of mentioned it. By early 2021, 49% say they're talking about it. Um, and, and there are times when their clients are more informed than they are. So that hype factor could really start to have an influence. And that's, that's dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. So listen, we, um, we're going to go to questions here in a minute. We've got some great questions in the Q&A. If you want to add any other questions, please do feel free. We're going to take a couple quick minutes because if you've heard any of Courtney and I's webinars that we've done in the past, you are very familiar with DDMC. It is what we believe is kind of the core curriculum around uh, name, image, and likeness to be able to provide protective education to student athletes. And when you think about uh, NFTs, cryptocurrency, and all that we're talking about today, you know, this is going to be a part of name, image, and likeness. And so protecting student athletes and providing that protective education is, is going to be critical. So DDMC stands for decision making, due diligence, money, and contracts. And if you could imagine, obviously, the first step from a decision making perspective is to have a, a process for being able to make decisions because to what Courtney said and to what Jonah said earlier, student athletes are going to have a lot of decisions to make as it relates to how they're going to involve themselves in name, image, and likeness. And if they want to get involved in things like NFTs, what does that look like? How does that uh, uh, play a role in their overall brand? How are they going to potentially engage? Does it, you know, if they, if somebody's coming at them right away when they're, you know, when they just get on your campus as a, a freshman, you know, what impact could that have in terms of their market, you know, down the road, right? So it's, it's really understanding all of these decisions that they're going to have to make when it comes to, you know, who's bringing them NFTs and things along those lines. So decision-making going to be critically important here. Yeah. And due diligence, again, as I mentioned, it's not just um, the education on the actual NFTs. It's the due diligence on all the people who are connected to creating one and selling one. And as everybody knows, we, again, teach a due diligence process. It's a process they can apply for the rest of their lives. And they would apply it to anybody that they are working with in the NFT space, just like they would for any other NIL activity. And then, of course, the money piece. Um, you know, obviously, we've been spending a lot of time talking about money. And people refer to financial literacy as an education topic. And it's great to provide some financial literacy education. That is such a broad and vast term. So as we move more into uh, more sessions of DDMC, you know, I imagine money will start to, will start having to do some sub workshops specifically around NFTs. And then contracts, Luke's favorite thing to talk about. And also I would say, as you're talking about it, maybe um, to answer the question that uh, is in the chat about the clarification sort of related to um, yeah. legal issues. Yep, so from a contract perspective, um, anything that a student athlete's gonna engage in as it relates to name, image, and likeness, there should be a contract uh, there. And I think from a process perspective, um, uh, I think all schools are gonna require that, that there be a contract so that it can go through their, you know, whatever the oversight process is. Um, 
So understanding kind of what a student athlete is giving up, what they're um, agreeing to, how they get compensated, how do they get compensated if something, you know, continues to sell beyond, you know, in a secondary market, if you will, all of those kind of things are going to need to be understood as it relates to the contract that they may engage in based on name image or based on NFTs. The question in the uh, Q&A that came up was around whether or not NFTs can include the marks of other companies. And to clarify um, or explain again quickly the discussion around owning an NFT and its relationship versus owning that media. So um, in the example was if you were to ever look at an NBA Top Shot um, NFT, that NFT is just based on, on a video of a play that occurs in a game. And so that play itself is media that's owned by the NBA and their media partners, right? And whatever that agreement is between the NBA and their media partners, that's who actually owns that clip that you see. And so when somebody buys an NFT, they own the NFT, but they don't actually own that video, if that makes sense. They don't own the, they don't have the ability to take that video and then go make something else out of it for commercial purposes, um, and so that's kind of that difference there. As it relates to the marks of other companies, um, the short answer would be no. In an NFT, um, unless, the, uh, unless either the, the company making the NFT or the actual athlete themselves have uh, agreed to um, a license agreement with a particular brand, um, then they won't be able to highlight that brand throughout the, in the NFT unless they've had some form of an agreement that allows for that to happen. Um, there are some fair use arguments that if there happens to be a, um, you know, something, a mark that's in an NFT that is, you know, maybe it's either indistinguishable or it's not, you know, uh, significant, right? It doesn't affect, you know, um, the overall kind of purpose. It doesn't have an impact on the, the market of the original work and things along those lines, then maybe that that's okay from a fair use perspective. But Student athletes, athletes in general who are doing NFTs have to be very, very mindful of what marks are being included from that perspective. And, and Jonah, I, I, I'd just like to bring you in then on that question. From a developing perspective, as you develop NFTs, kind of what's your, kind of what is your thought process around kind of other marks and just making sure that what you're putting out there as an NFT is something that you have all the rights to? Yeah, and I think this is a really important piece to it. And I think NIL will be very similar in sort of the content that comes out of that. I would say at this moment, right, staying away from marks, right? We would want to stay away from utilizing official marks um, with Renee's pieces of content. We stayed away from University of Connecticut where she played her college ball, right? This is not a University of Connecticut content piece. Um, you're dancing around a little bit of what the actual content is, but through illustration, animation, which we do, it's you can not really focus on the team jersey, the official marks. So we would stay away from that because that is owned by the university, uh, by the team and the league, right? So you'd want to stay away from that, but focus on the content. And we would do the same thing if we were creating a social media piece of content that is not directly tied to that lead and ensure that we're, we're not using the official marks. And I think that would help from a legal perspective, Luke, you would know better, but make sure that everybody feels safe and um, that they're not going to run into any issues on that side of it. Yeah, no, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so again, if you have questions, throw, feel free to throw them in the Q and a, we've got about seven or so minutes left and we're going to try to tackle as many questions as we can. Um, one of the questions is that, you know, we've been talking a lot about athletes selling NFTs um, and, you know, what have we seen with teams or conferences creating their own story through NFTs and thoughts on just conference or college institutions moving to creating NFT stories with, you know, throughout their different sports and, and our teams uh, and conferences allowed to create NFTs through plays of their athletes uh, or are those plays NFTs um, only allowed to be created by the athletes. So I'll, I'll take that on. And then Jonah and Courtney, please do chime in with your perspectives on it as well. Um, you know, We've had a lot of conversations recently with um, conferences wanting to understand a little bit more about NFTs and how does that work. And, you know, the initial thought, obviously, that we're thinking about is how to make sure that we protect the student athlete. But clearly, there's also opportunity for for teams and for conferences to create their own NFTs. And it really does come down to what is it that you're creating from my perspective. And I'm not the I'm not the creative type, so I don't want to go too far into your lane, Jonah, but it really does come down to what are you creating? And from a legal perspective, um, if you own media 
and you as an institution or you as a conference own certain media and want to use that media to help create um, an opportunity to tell a story and create these NFTs with your student athletes, you know, who are, ac who are absolutely actually the ones, you know, performing the sport, it would be no different than the commercials, the hype videos and the other things that are being done, you know, that showcase student athletes that part that's part of their agreement, um, you know, in playing at a particular institution and within a conference. Um, and so if a school or an institution already owns that particular media that they want to turn into an NFT um, and start to create that digital story, if you will, of their sports programs, I think we will absolutely see that as we as we move forward. Jonah, what, you're what exactly right. On? Yeah, you're totally right. That was a really good way of succinctly sort of uh, breaking this down. You know, it is ownership of what you have within your team or leader conference, right? So the Golden State Warriors example of the championship rings, we saw Renee's creative example of that similar was Golden State, they had an NFT to celebrate their championship rings. The visual creative aspect of that had nothing to do with the player. Yes, they won the title, um, but the ring was a Golden State Warriors piece of content. So they were able to own that, right? Uh, Stephen F. Austin recently did one uh, for their women's basketball team and it was a minted piece of content that they own. It wasn't necessarily has to be broken off to the players because uh, it, or eventually would be right under NIL, which is not um, you know, fully completed yet. So Ohio State owning a tweet that they posted, right? That would be ownable asset within Ohio State's sort of purview, right? They would own that piece so they could do that. A championship banner, something like that in NFT. So that's where it's actually pretty cool because there are some really nice ownable moments from a league or a conference that they can find ways to revenue. And also potentially, you know, again, the foundational aspect of it, right? Giving back to some of, um, you know, the, the fundraising that they do or the charity endeavor endeavors that they are involved in. And I think the conferences as a whole can benefit from that. And remember too that, and you kind of touched on, the media distribution is when it gets tricky, right? Because like the conferences, ACC, Big 12, Big 10, ESPN, SEC Network, things are more fractured than they've ever been from a media distribution perspective. So that's when it probably would have to get uh, where everybody would have to be on board and signed and, and contracts would have to be, uh, have to take place. From an athlete perspective, they would also then, you know, similar to the jerseys being sold in arena, now with NIL, NIL eventually coming down, they would have to receive sort of a portions of the proceeds moving forward. So it's a pretty easy way to sort of see how these things can line up. Um, but we're certainly going to have the, more of these cases moving forward. Yeah. So we've got two questions that I want to see if we can hit in the next two minutes uh, before we close out. So Courtney, real quick, I'll throw it over to you. Um, relating to uh, the name, image, and likeness discussion, will there be concern about the actual payment of student athletes for these NFTs? given the concern about booster payments or the yet to be defined fair market value discussion that's been a major part of name, image, and likeness? Great uh, question. And I would say, uh, yes, concern about all of the above. What can be done about it? I, I don't know, because I would imagine, I mean, as it stands now, boosters, especially if they, if they own a company and they want to hire a student athlete and pay fair market value for whatever they're paying the student athlete for, they're absolutely, absolutely allowed to do that. So I'm guessing in theory, they could certainly purchase a student athlete's NFT. I think the determining fair market value will take years and years and years. Um, so I don't think that we're gonna have a gauge on what that is for a long time. So is it feasible that a booster could buy an NFT for an absurd amount of money and say that's what the market will bear? Right now, yes. Uh, when you look at supply demand, it's a brand new market. Um, so I think that that will be tough. I don't know if that will factor into any sort of rules and regulations around it. And having said that, I'm not sure that there would be an ability to make such a rule that there would that athletes couldn't, student athletes couldn't create their own FTs and sell them. NFTs and sell them. So I think that's a wide open space and um, definitely room for both uh, boosters getting involved and in paying more than maybe somebody else would. And also, um, you know, the, the, the other concern, it's, it's 
a brand new space and fair market value will be um, take a long time to determine. And also, if you think about it in terms of buying a piece of artwork, that's not a liquid market. So I, I don't, fair market value is also going to be subject to um, the, the sort of mark to market around long-term investments in creative pieces. Awesome. So last question. Um, I know we're here about out of time. Five years from now, uh, NFTs, let's just say if they're no longer in high demand, what would you envision would have led to their downfall? I think what I would say is at one point we had eight tracks and then we had, you know, cassette tapes. And then for a brief period, we had laser discs before we got to CDs. And now, I mean, when's the last time you bought a CD, right? Um, so I think the, the, the downfall would be, you know, we move on to whatever the new technology is. And maybe it's holograms. Maybe it's a little, you know, you, you get a penny or a coin or something, you press it. And all of a sudden the hologram of the play comes up instead of, you know, actually going on and on doing it online. So I think we could probably envision um, new technologies being that thing that leads to the downfall of uh, NFTs in the future. But with that, it's five o'clock. We want to say thank you so much. Jonah Ballo, um, Heartland Group, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate thank your you. uh, insights today. Thank you so much, Luke and Courtney. This was terrific. And again, if anybody wants to reach out, Jonah at heartland.com. Email is always open for more of these questions. I love the conversation. I love learning more. Courtney, you hit on a very important thing. Knowledge is probably the most important thing before you jump into any of these aspects. So I love that we're all discussing this in an open forum like this. So I appreciate you guys having me on the panel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Jonah. I learned so much today. And um, I... It's all incredibly fascinating and I love the creative piece of it. I just, I'm excited to see more NFTs and, and all the creation that's gonna come out of athletes and, and artists and anybody else. Awesome. So everybody that joined us, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. If you have any questions or want to discuss more about name, image, and likeness, about NFTs, about protective education, feel free to reach out to Courtney or myself. Um, and we look forward to talking to you all again real soon. Thanks for joining us today. Take care, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.